Well, hello once again. Welcome back to Community Bible Study. Please join us tonight as we look at Revelation chapters 15 and 16. I know you're really excited. So am I. Uh, hey, I, I read in the paper today. So here's a question. I got something I read in the paper today. Do you, do you ever make mistakes about about sending an email or a text to the wrong person? You, you send it at supposed to be private it's supposed to be and maybe not so private but but you just hit the wrong recipient you send it to the wrong person i i read about a guy today in the paper and and uh, so he's a chicago businessman and and you know about the brutal winters they've been having up there and he decided to go to florida for a for a long weekend to escape the the cold his his wife had to stay home for a few days uh for, for a while, she was going to meet him down there for for uh, uh, the vacation after after a few days, and and so uh, she said, "Send me an email when you get there and tell me you arrived safely." And so so he did, um, and and he arrived safely and sent an email back to his wife. The problem is, the message went to a little old lady in Nebraska, the wife of a pastor who had died earlier in the week. She was shocked when she turned on her computer and and checked her email messages, and here was this email message. My darling wife, I just wanted you to know that I arrived safely here, and I am looking forward to you joining me here tomorrow. <laughs> Signed, your beloved husband. P.S. It's hot down here. <laughs> that, that's a shock. That's a shock. So be careful. Be careful uh, who you send messages to, and and more importantly, be, be careful about the messages that you read, right? The message of this lesson, hmm, wow. I was thinking about the message to this lesson as I drove to church this Sunday, and I noticed, as, as we always do, my church has a banner out front announcing the message of the week, the topic of the sermon, or the topic of the passage, and, and I thought, okay, so my church is doing <laughs> Revelation, maybe, if they ever do it. And and so can you imagine driving by uh, for the message this week and seeing on the church banner, um, this week's message, God's wrath. <laughs> and so people drive by and say, I'd be heading on to the lake. I, I think Starbucks is much better, right? So, so have you ever heard a sermon on God's wrath? Raise your hand. Okay, I can't see any hands. So I assume none of you have. Um, so this is your, your first sermon on God's wrath. Are you really excited? Yeah. Let's pray. Father, you know, we like to have fun. We like to be serious. This is serious stuff. And, and your message for us is serious. So, Father, we ask that you be the speaker. That's what we always ask. You take the words that are spoken and you turn them into your words that what that what we hear might might change our lives and might encourage us to draw closer to you and tell more of our friends about you. We pray this, Father, in Jesus name. So let's go bowling with angels, right? We'll ask what and we'll look at the Seven bowls of wrath, and we'll ask so what, and we'll look at two questions. We'll ask now what, and we'll we'll find out their sound advice in this chapter. But through it all, I want us to understand that God is just. God is just, so we praise him for that. John says, I saw in heaven another great and marvelous sign, seven angels with the seven last plagues last, thank God, because with them God's wrath is completed. It says, I saw what looked like a sea of glass mixed with fire and standing beside the sea. Some of your translations say on the sea. Those who had been victorious over the beast and his image and over the number of his name. Who are these people? They're people that have been martyred by by Satan or the Antichrist. But they're studs, you know? They're gold medal winners standing on the podium. Chapter 12, verse 11 describes them well. 
Then I heard a loud voice in heaven, John says, say, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ for the accuser of our brothers who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. And these people, the chapter 16 people, they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. Why? Because they did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Wow, what a testimony. They didn't love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Instead, they maintained their testimony before the Lord. And now, now they're in heaven. They left earth ridiculed as losers, maybe to arrive in, in heaven to the applause of the angels. You know, in, in this passage, it shows us that, that Satan is just an elevator boy transporting saved souls to heaven. It's the saints' shuttle service that Satan operates. Maybe they say like, like Paul says in his first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 15, Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not vain. Thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. After this, John says, I looked, saw the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven, which was opened, and out of the temple came the seven angels with the seven plagues. They were dressed in clean, shining linen, showing these, these judgments are pure and holy. One of the cherubim gave to the seven angels, seven bowls filled with the wrath of God. Wow. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go pour out the seven bowls of God's wrath on the earth. Ah! The first bowl of judgment, the first bowl of God's wrath is poured out on the land and its inhabitants, its citizens, those who show allegiance to to Satan and beastly boils broke out on those who follow the Antichrist and and reject the real Christ. And did you notice these these boils broke out? They were not put on them. In other words, these are an external eruption of internal corruption. And the second bowl of God's judgment is poured out on the sea, the sea representing unbelieving nations. People dead to God lose their livelihood. And the third bowl of judgment is poured out on the fresh water, which is turned to blood, judging those who reject the living water of Jesus Christ. The fourth bowl of judgment is poured out on the sun, the Satan followers had turned up the heat on the believers, so God turns up the thermostat on the sun, let me see, 100 million degrees. And the fifth bowl, I love this, was, was poured out on the throne, the pretend throne of the Antichrist, the alternative Christ. The throne being the symbol of his power is destroyed. These Satan followers rejected the light of the world, so God gives them the desire of their life. You like living in the dark? Let me give you pitch black darkness. For those of you that are ancient like me, you might remember this is Don Meredith saying, turn out the lights, the party's over. And the sixth bowl of judgment dries up the Euphrates and, and demonic frogs gather the earth's kings to battle Israel. Who wants to follow a frog into battle? But they will find a different opponent for them when they, when they reach the, the fields of Armageddon. Napoleon said that the Valley of Megiddo is the most natural battlefield of the whole earth. And the seventh, the final bowl of God's judgment is poured out into the air, destroying the kingdom of the air, the kingdom of Satan. Satan is called the prince of the air. 
and earthquakes, you know, 12 out of 10 on the Richter scale and hail, 100 pound hails, you know, hail the size of a St. Bernard. Whoa. And what do the Satanists do? They repent, right? No. <laughs> Three times they curse God for giving them what they deserve. Wow. You know, let's be honest, guys, as we talk you know, about our lesson, we have questions. <laughs> Boy, do we have questions. Boy, do we have questions. Man, do I hear your questions and don't. Don't I know we have questions? Here, here are two, just two. First of all, is all this fair? Second of all, what about the mark of the beast? <laughs> is all this fair? As my 11-year-old grand girl likes to say, duh. <laughs> Three times, chapter 16, verse 9, verse 11, verse 21, upon Suffering under the judgments, they cursed the name of God and they refused to repent three times. They curse God. I mean, what did they expect, right? <laughs> Jim Croce said, you don't tug on Superman's cape. You don't spit in the wind and you don't mess around with God. 21 21 judgments, horrible judgments. Is that fair? Look, let's be clear here. These judgments are not for, for talking in class, not for, for chewing gum at school. These judgments fall only on those who have absolutely, positively, consciously, voluntarily, and irrevocably spit in God's face. These are the people who, who see Christ on the cross and spit on him. And they reject the offer of salvation from the Holy Spirit. Second chance. Look, we, we've covered this. Are you keeping score? My, my count, it's 1,283 second chances. What kind of God will do this? A God who loves his followers and has justice for those who reject him. What kind of God would never judge murderers and rapists and terrorists and dictators who murder millions of people to those who tell God to get out of their lives, he says, I will give you the desires of your heart. A God, a parent, who never judges wrongs against his children is not a good God, but this is a good God. As the angel says, you, God, are just in these judgments. You who are and who were the Holy One because you have so judged. For they have shed the blood of your saints and your prophets and you have given them blood to drink as they deserve. To get what they deserve. What about me? Will he judge my wrongs? Yes. He already did. He judged all of my wrongs by penalizing Christ on the cross who took my sins upon himself and paid the penalty that I deserve. And so will I suffer under these judgments? No. No. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him will not perish, but instead will have everlasting life. Yeah, but what about those believers who take the mark of the Antichrist? Okay, let's put this one to bed, guys. Chapter 16, verse 2. As the first bold 
of judgment pours out their sores on people who had the mark of the beast and worshiped his image. Chapter 14, verse 9, if anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead, he will drink the wine of God's fury. Chapter 14, verse 10, anyone who worships the beast and his image and receives the mark will be tormented and have no rest day or night. What about that? Yeah, well, what about that? These words, if you study them in the Greek, and I have, these words worship and receive and worship and receive and accept, they are present tense, meaning they are continuous action, a continuous action of worshiping and receiving. They are the continuous, conscious act of the will, uninterrupted by repentance. And I love the little words of the Bible. And the word and here is a big little word. These people swear allegiance to the unholy trinity and reap the consequences. They receive his mark and worship the beast. They receive the mark and worship the beast. They receive the mark and worship his image. These are not people who've been forced to take a tattoo in order to buy groceries they are not the ones that Jesus asked his father to forgive for they don't know what they're doing. These people know what they're doing. Jesus says seven times in the gospel of John, those who follow me can never be snatched out of my hand. Look, guys, sometimes we get obsessed with our role in salvation rather than God's role. There is nothing Nothing Satan can do to overturn God's election and undo his adoption of us. For we are saved by grace through faith. This not of ourselves, so that no one can boast. This not of ourselves, so that no one can take it away. So what? There's justification for the faithful and justice for the faithless. For those made righteous by Christ, there's victory. For those who have chosen to reject Christ, they are vanquished. For Christ followers, their salvation. For Satan followers, their suffering. God is just. Praise him. So now what? Sometimes I love our passages because the application is right there in our, in our Bible. Chapter 16, verse 15. Blessed is he who stays awake and keeps his clothes with him so that he may not go naked and be shamefully exposed. <laughs> Sound advice from Scripture. Good advice. Advice number one. Stay awake. Stay awake. We've heard that before. Keep your eyes open. Don't be deceived by fake news. Don't be deceived by fake Bible application and interpretation. Read your texts. <laughs> read your texts carefully on your mobile phone. <laughs> and read your texts in the Bible carefully. And understand what they say. Number two. Not only stay awake, but keep your clothes on. For some of you, please keep your clothes on. <laughs> Look, Paul tells us in Romans chapter 13 to clothe yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ. We're told in Galatians that we wear the clothes of Christ. We are clothed now with Christ. Once you accept Christ, you wear Christ as your clothing. And as he says at the end of the letter to the Ephesians, put on the full armor of God to protect yourself from the attacks of the enemy. Keep your clothes on and put on the armor of God. Number three, trust in God's character. This is not a mythological being we serve. Great and marvelous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty, say the martyrs. Just and true are your ways, King of the ages. 
Who will not fear you, O Lord, and bring glory to your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. God is great and marvelous. He is just and true. He is awesome and glorious. He alone is holy. He alone is worthy of our worship. Trust in God's character. And number four, praise him for your salvation. Praise him for your salvation. Not something you earned, but something he granted you by his grace. By his grace, you are saved. And chapter 16 will have no application to you. I turned to one of my favorite books of the Bible, the prophet Zephaniah. You, you probably read Zephaniah in your quiet time this morning, right? Zephaniah says to the followers of God, the Lord has taken away your punishment. He has turned back your enemy. The Lord, the King of Israel, is with you. Never again will you fear any harm. On that day, the day we're talking about in chapter 16, on that day they will say to Jerusalem, Do not fear, O Zion. Do not let your hands hang limp. The Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. The God of heaven, the righteous God, the holy God, the just God will sing over you in heaven. Can you imagine that? The one who is worthy above all will count you worthy enough that he will sing over you. He will sing over you with joy in heaven. Will you thank him for your salvation and his song? Will you praise him? Let's pray. Oh, Father God, it is uh, almost unbelievable to know that we will arrive in heaven to the applause of the angels and that you will be so joyous to see us that you will sing over us. We don't deserve that, Father, except for the fact that Jesus has made us worthy by his righteousness. And so we give back to you all glory and honor and majesty and praise to the glory of your Son, Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen.